Thank you uh, very much for that. Unfortunately, I've heard that uh, Nantongo Josephine is unable to join us live for the questions because of connectivity issues, but I believe Pumzile is um, online and so we should be able to have um, some questions. Some questions have come through. We're going to have a little uh, time now to address some of those questions and then we will move into session two of the best practices. So um, the first question that came through is for Shannon from UNAIDS, and this question comes from Father Bauer. Um, the question is, in your presentation you have spoken about inequalities. We know that only half of all children living with HIV have access to treatment and that COVID-19 is posing huge challenges to ensure access to services for all including children. In the recent communication around the new HIV strategy, UNAIDS has identified 11 priorities of action. Children are not listed among them. What should we do as faith groups and leaders to ensure that children are considered as a priority by UNAIDS and included in, as such in the new strategy? Over to you, Shannon. Yes, thank you. That is a truly important and a, just a, a really critical question. So I could not agree more. Um, despite a lot of efforts by so many people over the years, we are lagging farther behind on children uh, than almost any other group. Um, I think the listing that came out on the strategy, um, I actually had given some comments at the time. It didn't reflect where kids were going to be discussed. and in the actual breakout sessions themselves, um, we ask that the pediatric um, uh, services and treatment and uh, response be smack in the middle of the leadership uh, and investment category there. Because, you know, we have a lot of tools um, for children. Fortunately, we're getting better formulations for pediatric drugs, thanks in part to the Vatican partnership um, and so much advocacy that went on there. Um, but it's much more fragile. And so how do we really um, use these moments in time to say, how do we reignite leadership and commitments and financial investments for children? I think as we come out of COVID and even as we're in COVID, this, the, the complement to some of the interruptions you, you mentioned are also the nearly 50% of children who are living with HIV, who haven't been diagnosed and aren't on treatment at all. Um, two thirds of these are five years old and older. And so how do we also redefine some of our family services so that we're sure that all uh, parents living with HIV have gotten their older children even tested at least once rather than perhaps missing the chance to do so. So absolutely um, welcome that comment. And I would say, yes, bring it up over and over and over again, send your comments in and participate in focus groups. And it must be a huge part of the next strategy. Agree. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. We have a, a question for Katie that's come through. The question comes from World Relief. Katie, in adapting differentiated service delivery through multi-month dispensing, have there been issues with ensuring the supply chain, especially in remote areas? If so, what strategies are PEPFA using to address this? Over to you, Katie. So yes, we, we know about this issue and we are very concerned with it. Um, one of the um, you know, we know that there's enough uh, drugs and supplies that have come into country, but the, the challenge really is, and particularly in the setting of a, um, in the setting of uh, restricted travel, is the, um, is, is getting, uh, getting supplies out to the, um, uh, about, out to the uh, more remote communities. Um, what we've tried to do is really ev carefully evaluate the data as it comes in and try to develop a regional strategy on a country by country basis. It and you know, we've just gotten our quarter three data in, which is really, um, and we're in the process of, of thinking about it. So I think that we'll be able to um, develop, uh, develop better strategies for that. We do hear anecdotal reports that there, that there are um, issues with the supply chain. I think 
part, um, some of the bigger issues really have to do with laboratory supplies and laboratory reagents. Um, and we're hoping that that doesn't really uh, mean that the that there's a sort of a structural um, uh, something something structural that is affecting the ability to do TB testing, for example. Over. Thank you very much for that um, answer. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have come through with regards to my presentation too, so I will um, quickly try to answer some of those. There was a question on um, vaccine safety and the ex expedited process. Of course, I think vaccines are talked about in a huge way on every many different fora um, at the moment, and so it's a very contentious issue. Um, I just want to say very quickly that the reason why there can be an expedited process is that uh, there are different ways by which this process can be expedited, but it doesn't compromise on the safety checks. Firstly, you can expedite the research ethics approvals, you can expedite regulatory approvals, you can quicken the process of vaccine development by actually combining phase one and phase two trials that look at the sort of the baseline safety and effectiveness characteristics of these candidate um, vaccines. At the moment, there are over 200 candidate uh, vaccines in the pipeline at various stages in um, development. And WHO is really working uh, very, very closely with vaccine developers to ensure that we have standard endpoints and data collection mechanisms to regularly monitor both the efficacy and the safety of these vaccines. So yes, while we're trying very much to speed up the process, we are working hard to ensure that we're not compromising on all the safety checks that normally take place in a normal vaccine development um, timeline and timescale. So, um, I will leave that answer there. Um, I think uh, it would be great to have um, a question for um, from Zile. There have been um, a number of questions on the ch on the chat about engaging faith based organisations in research, and are there mechanisms by which this can be done at the national level? So I wonder, um, from Zile, at whether at your um, the work that you do at, an, at a local level, whether you, there are any research initiatives that include faith-based organizations. Over to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, so maybe what I can say, what I can say at the moment, um, we don't have any research project, but uh, towards the end of the project, we'll have an evaluation just to see the impact of this um, faith and community initiative, whereby we'll be able to track uh, retrospectively what, uh, whether people were coming uh, to facilities for confirmatory, then we'll uh, track all our indicators from HTS post and up, up until uh, treatment level. So what we have done so that we will be able to track uh, all this, um, in our uh, testing register, uh, HIV testing register, we have included some variables whereby we'll, we are sure that when you come for confirmation, we ask you if you got the, the kit from the FCI uh, initiative. So. In that way, that's the only evaluation uh, we'll have uh, in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your contribution. I think um, perhaps I can make a, a slight comment on that as well. It also relates to another question that came in, um, which was about um, how to engage um, how to engage faith-based organizations in the national uh, response under the national health systems, because particularly in, in, in countries where there are delivering a lot of health um, services. And I think that this is something that uh, WHO at least is very aware of. Um, however, I think what we would advocate for from a WHO perspective is that uh, national health authorities include 
faith-based organizations and other civil society organizations in the planning of a response, not just for COVID, but other disease um, health and health crises. And that they are, as somebody mentioned before, a critical partner in not only the planning of that, but also the implementation. And I would then see that as the first step by which then faith communities and faith-based organizations would be included in other research initiatives around um, uh, pandemics or um, epidemics. And so I hope um, that that answered uh, the question um, in some way. Um, I think um, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, move on um, to session two of the best practices. In this session, uh, the panelists, we have panelists representing the research and community engagement communities. And these panelists will speak about efforts to address HIV among affected communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. The session is entitled, Nothing About Us Without Us. The challenges in listening to those most affected when responding to HIV and COVID-19. Once again, um, our panelists have also pre-recorded their presentations and will introduce themselves very effectively in the presentation. And so I'd like to invite you now to listen to Eddie Jackson, Reverend Kimberly Jackson and Justin Smith in this uh, pre-recorded session. Over. <laughs> 